So, welcome back. Uh, now we are ready to uh, move on with the program. And I am happy to introduce Professor Stephen J. Cook from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. He has a wide-ranging interest in uh, integrative biology, conservation science and natural resource management. He uh, works, spans the natural and social science and focuses on developing solutions to problems facing fish and other aquatic organisms. I hope all of this is true. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and he will not be unemployed in the future, it seems, because my ne next fun fact says that finfish represents the largest component of aquaculture industry in Canada with over 26 different species farmed. So I say, wow, <laughs> how many do we have in Norway? Five or six or something? So uh, you have really a uh, lot to do, uh, uh, Professor uh, Cook. So uh, the floor is yours, and the lesson is about uh, learning, uh, sharing lessons from the recreational fisheries sector. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Uh, we're going to talk wreck fishing. So I actually don't do much work in the aquaculture sector, but I do work in the recreational sphere, and I do some work in the, the commercial sphere. And I just want to direct your attention to that photo. And so in the foreground, we have a child with a, a fishing rod in hand engaging in recreational fishing. And in the background, we have a commercial fishing boat, a vessel. And when you think about those things, we immediately look at them as being very different. But for a long time, I've been wondering about those, those similarities. And in fact, working with Ian Cowkes from the UK, uh, back in the early 2000s, we wrote a paper where we contrasted and compared the recreational and commercial sector. Uh, similarly, working with Howard Brownman and other folks, uh, we've mused about fish welfare from a variety of perspectives perspectives, including aquaculture, recreational sphere, commercial sphere, and also from a, a research perspective. So what I'm going to do today when I talk about the recreational fishing space and bring some of, of, of those stories to you, um, it's not that different. We've crossed these lines before. There's a lot of opportunity to share uh, across sectors, and, and that's why I'm really here today. So this is recreational fishing, and this is recreational fishing. But sometimes it can look like this. Uh, that's in Florida, and so those boats are all fishing, and, and it really gets quite crammed. Uh, when the fish are running, uh, certainly along riverbanks, it can get cramped as well. Uh, we call that combat fishing, uh, because oftentimes it, it leads to violence among the participants uh, uh, when somebody's fish uh, gets hooked in the next line and, and so on. Uh, and a reminder, I come from Canada. It is cold, and for much of the year, water is frozen, so we also engage engage in ice fishing. Again, an extreme example here, uh, but just wanted to, to paint a picture of what recreational fishing looks like. Um, back in 2012, uh, a number of us convened in Berlin to define recreational fishing. I don't know why it took us three days, but it did, uh, to come up with this definition. And uh, the intention here is to, of course, differentiate recreational fishing from subsistence fisheries and commercial fisheries. So I'm not going to read the entire definition there. Uh, I'm going to emphasize some of the, the underlined words there. So primary nutritional, in other words, you can eat fish, but it's usually not your primary means of, uh, uh, of obtaining uh, protein and nutrients. Uh, and also that we're usually not selling or trading them. When we do that, then we start to get into that, that commercial space. Um, I do want to point out there's no mention of rod and reel. Okay. Uh, there is a rifle season for suckers in West Virginia. You can use gill nets recreationally in the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm showing you bow fishing, which that's another, all these things are from the U.S. Uh, the bow fishing example here in the middle, spear fishing, very common in uh, uh, clear sort of tropical, subtropical marine systems. That's all recreational fishing. What I'm going to talk today is largely the angling side of things, which is with rod and reel. If you ask me how many fish we catch in, in, uh, in the recreational uh, 
base each year. Those numbers that are sort of generated by UNFAO, every country keeps statistics, they send them to Rome in terms of landed biomass from the commercial sector. Those numbers as, you know, they're imperfect, but they're reasonably robust. For the recreational sector, the answer is we don't know. There's very few countries that actually keep national level statistics on the number of people that are the we usually know how many people fish, but we don't know how much they catch and how many of those fish they harvest versus return back from the water. Canada is one of the few exceptions, yay. Uh, and if we take those numbers for Canada and simply extrapolate those up to a global population, and I know that makes no sense, but we did it, uh, we get a number of recreational capture rates around 47 billion fish per year, of which two thirds or so are released. That would be about 30 billion fish. Even if my back of the ca uh, napkin calculations here are off by an order of magnitude, the point is we are talking about billions of animals that anglers interact with each year. The species specific release rates are highly variable. So on the left here, that's a walleye, a, a yummy freshwater fish in North America. Very few of them get released. Uh, over here you have Xander, which is a, a close relative, very, very tasty. So they end up in uh, the fry pan. And then off to the right there, that's a muscalunge, uh, very similar to the northern pike that you have here in Europe. Uh, trophy fish, highly specialized anglers target them. They're called the fish of 10,000 casts, and uh, for good reason. And about 99% of those fish are released, a highly specialized fishery. In terms of catch and release, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, those fish that are caught and released, so not unlike what would happen in the commercial sphere in terms of bycatch, discards, and so on, uh, catch and release has existed for some time. Uh, in some cases, it's mandated. So when we have harvest regulations that require a given uh, species or size, or if there's a bag limit, whatever the case may be, we require people to put fish back. It can also be voluntary, the conservation of the ethic of the angler. They could legally harvest that fish, but they opt to harvest them, uh, opt to release them, uh, to let them swim another day, to grow, to reproduce, whatever the, the case may be. Um, discouraged. Sometimes fisheries managers are actually trying to manipulate a population. They want people to keep the little ones, and no one will do it. Everybody just keeps releasing them. So sometimes they actually try and di they discourage catch and release. And then verboten, any good Germans in the room? <laughs> forbidden, okay? Uh, and uh, in Germany, uh, technically forbidden, but at the same time, if there are rules in place, laws in place that say that you can't keep this fish, then it's absolutely legal to return that animal to the water. So even the catch and release re legislation that exists in Germany is really done through, uh, it, it's not um, uh, uh, final, if you will. Um, in terms of context, uh, even though groups like Trout Unlimited and other NGOs like to push the idea that this is something they invented, uh, the reality is that people have been re uh, releasing fish for a long time. Uh, here's some uh, old English texts and French texts. Uh, there were harvest regulations that existed back in the 14 and 1500s. And harvest regulations inherently mean you are releasing fish. And so catch and release has existed really for quite some time. So what do we know about it? So we're at about 425 published studies on recreational catch and release. Uh, three quarters of those are on five or six species, things like rainbow trout, striped bass, walleye, and, and so on. Atlantic salmon is another one that's, that's very well studied. Uh, and many other of our 30,000 plus fish out there that we know virtually nothing for. Um, many of those fish are released and some die. Mortality rates are highly variable, anywhere from 0.1% up to near total mortality. We do some work on bonefish in the South Pacific, and it's a very sharky place, and almost all of those bonefish are chowed down on predators within a couple minutes of release. Ten, less than 10% is generally considered low mortality, and there's, of course, all sorts of sublethal effects, things like injury, disease, uh, stress, behavior, growth impairments, and so on. There are lots of things that influence the outcome of a fishing event, whether or not a fish will live or die, and the extent to which uh, it may be Im impaired, its fitness impaired in some way. Uh, some of it deals with the biology of the fish. So some of the work we've done in British Columbia on sockeye salmon tells us that female, sorry, uh, yes, that female salmon are twice as likely to die from a fisheries interaction as a male salmon. So it can vary by sex. It varies by body size, by species, and so on. 
Um, it varies by environment, warmer temperatures, and in very cold temperatures, things usually go not quite, quite as well as moderate temperatures. Um, depth, we have barotrauma issues in the recreational space. Uh, space, just like in, in some of the commercial spaces, and of course predators. So if you're releasing uh, angled fish and they are impaired in any way, and there are predators around, whether it be birds or mammals or, uh, or other fish, that can certainly be a problem as well. I've bolded things that are more in control of the angler, and I realize anglers can decide to fish shallow or not fish at all, but in general, when we start thinking about angler behavior, we're talking about air exposure or handling, how they interact with that fish, their gear choices, so these are decisions they might make the day before when they're in their garage getting things ready before they actually go fishing, and then angler experience and, and knowledge. So context and biotic variation matter, but at the end of the day, it's really about angler behavior and including gear choice that mediates what, what happens to the fish. This next figure I don't expect you to digest other than to realize that from the moment a fish is hooked till the moment it swims away and might sulk for a while and, and hopefully recover, there's a lot of things that can happen to that animal that, that uh, range from the extent to which the exercise occurred, uh, the extent of hook injury, and so on. So there's lots of places where things can go wrong for the fish. When we look at those 425 studies, there's one thing that really pops out. The, one, the single biggest driver of mortality, catch and release mortality, is where a fish is hooked. And not surprisingly, fish that are hooked in the gullet or throat or esophagus, whatever you want to call it, are more likely to die than a fish that is hooked in uh, more shallow tissues like the, the jaw region. Um, so the best option then would be to minimize deep hooking in the first place. So there's all sorts of research that's been done sort of digging into that. Uh, things that we know influences where a, a fish gets hooked are things like the bait or lure type. And we know that organic baits, whether that's live bait or dough, uh, tends to be taken deeper because it's more of a real food item than, say, a metal, uh, a metal spoon. Um, we know that bait and lure size influences things. So smaller things might seem like they might lead to less injury, but a fish can ingest something smaller more easily than something that's bigger. It's just more that they can get in their, their mouth or their, their gullet. Fishing style or method matters. Um, I have three kids. They love to fish with bobbers. That's passive fishing. They're not paying attention. The bobber is two feet under the water already um, versus trolling and all of a sudden, you know, a fish hits and you're reeling it in right away. So, so fishing method matters. Experience matters. I'll go back to my children. A lot more deep hooking with my kids than with experts that can feel that a fish is even looking at their, at their lure before they set the, set the hook. That's what experts tell me. Um, and then, of course, hook type and style. Uh, conventional J hooks are pretty common in our, in our, spe in our sector, uh, but there's certainly been a move towards circle hooks. Uh, we've done some work. We did a meta-analysis uh, a number of years ago, uh, and we saw on average about a 50% reduction in mortality when folks use circle hooks relative to J-styled hooks in the, in the recreational realm. Not uniform. There were examples of where they performed equally or in some cases were even worse, uh, but by and large seems to be reasonably useful, especially when using live bait. Uh, and what was really interesting to see how this was really pushed by the recreational fishing sector. And you're going to see that as a bit of a theme here, where it's not necessarily scientists sitting in our office coming up with things to try. I'm reading fishing magazines, I'm talking to anglers, I'm getting ideas, I'm seeing what they're doing already, and then I do some work in that space and help, to help them refine that practice. In some cases, dispel what they've, they've suggested as being good. In other cases, really amplify it as, as something that, that's great, and this is what we, we should be doing. In this case, it was Joan Vernon from the Billfish Foundation who really pushed circle hooks, uh, and they're, they've now been adopted for almost all of the billfish and tuna tournaments. Uh, because you get really nice jaw hooking in the corner there, and then uh, we've been trying them on things like, like musky. I gave you that example already that some of these are angler-led innovations. Not all of them are good innovations, unfortunately. Um, a lot of work's been put um, focused on trying to help get fish off the line, so developing special hook removal gears. Uh, this guy in the bottom is trying to sell a chemical that you can put in your live well to help fish recover. It's, very, it's magical. It does everything that you could possibly imagine. So we do tests on, on these things to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, so you can go on Amazon and buy all sorts of things uh, that help you, purportedly help 
help you to remove the hooks from fish. And then you can even make your own out of a toothbrush if you watch YouTube videos. So uh, we did a study where we were comparing these for deeply hooked fish. If a fish is deeply hooked, do these help remove them effortlessly, as most of these products claim? Um, we terminated the study. I usually don't do this because when you stop a study, then you don't have statistical rigor. But we used animal welfare stopping rules. And we wrote a short note. And the title says it all. Um, hook disgorgers remove deep hooks, but they kill fish. And so if you're going to harvest that fish, fine. But if the idea is to release them, no, they don't release, uh, they don't, uh, uh, the fish are not in good shape. Uh, all but one of the 17 fish died after hook removal, whereas the fish that were hooked in the jaw or had the line cut, those are one was a control and one was a, a line cutting method, which, which across the board works very well, much higher survival. Uh, we, had, we had no mortality. So uh, do not invest in these hook removal gears. Uh, they just, uh, and uh, particularly for, uh, for deeply hooked fish. This might seem absurd, but some anglers were really pushing the idea that uh, pop or soda or cola, I don't know what different people call it in different countries, uh, is effective for stopping the bleeding of fish. So when you catch a fish, you should simply pour. Um, Mountain Dew is the favorite, Diet Coke second favorite. So uh, we tested both of those. Uh, we even got a soda stream and carbonated lake water as one of our treatments. Uh, we did the study. I'm going to show you the newspaper headline, which is Carlton study suggests Diet Coke doesn't go with fish. So keep it in the cooler. If anybody wants to get into the details there, I can tell you why it tricked anglers into thinking it worked. But at the end of the day, it actually provides no benefit and gives the illusion that the fish is swimming away in good condition when that is not the case. Some of the other kind of work we do is around mesh type. And I know that's relevant to this group, a lot of commercial fishing uh, uh, fishers in the, the audience. So we compare different mesh types. We've done this for bluegill. We've done this for, for brook trout. And sometimes we discover things that aren't intuitive. So for example, the mesh on the far right is rubber coated and was really good for the fish in terms of reducing abrasion, uh, reducing scale loss, reducing fin fraying, and so on. But the hooks got caught in there. So you spent, we ended up with really long air exposure times because the hooks were stuck in the mesh and the fish were stuck between the, the hook and the mesh. So things that we didn't expect. So it wasn't just about mesh type, it was that interaction between the mesh type and the, the lure that was being used. Um, fishing at warmer temperatures, this is unfortunately becoming more of a problem with climate change. We know that mortality rate and injury and stress is all mediated by, by water temperature. And in general, as water temperatures get warmer, things tend to go more, more poorly. Uh, and this is a generalized figure that we can populate, this mortality rate versus water temp for largemouth, striped bass, and Atlantic salmon, probably another handful of species by now. Um, what I want to point out is that shaded box in the middle, where we're starting to see more and more examples of uh, fishing groups, fishing clubs, uh, engaging in activities um, that are voluntary. So saying, you know what, on these hot summer days, uh, we're going to stop fishing when water temperatures are above X degrees Celsius. At the end of the day, when we're working with anglers, we spend a lot of time focusing on voluntary behaviors. Sure, I work with fisheries managers, and we could regulate the heck out of folks, but nobody likes that. And at the end of the day, we oftentimes end up with reasonably low compliance. So we spend a lot of time trying to identify what those best practices are and figuring out how to share them with anglers. One of the ways we do that is through our human dimensions work. So in this case, we interviewed recreational fishers in the lower Fraser River. They're fishing for Pacific salmon. And we asked them about their preferences. How did they learn about responsible fishing practices? And when we did so, we, we, we were able to break them into very three more or less discrete groups. The first is old school, which were people that, wanted, that didn't use the internet and they wanted it to be in regulation books or brochures. We had another third of the respondents that were investigative. They would find the information they needed on the internet or through various sources. And the last was networking. So they would go to tackle shops, they would talk to conservation officers and so on. So that implies that you can't do one thing. You can't just produce a brochure. Uh, you can't just do an online video. If if you're trying to share best practices, you need to meet people where they're at, and people have uh, heterogeneous communication preferences. The other thing I want to point out is there is fairly strong support for mandatory angler education programs. These are still very rare. You require 
mandatory hunter education programs, but this is something that we're starting to see more talk about uh, associated with licensing schemes. We can produce brochures. This is one we did for the Bahamas. So when people are going to the own islands fishing for bonefish, the customs officer hands them this pamphlet on how to handle bonefish. Uh, we also work with um, um, different uh, sort of social uh, driven uh, campaigns. Uh, this is the Keep Fish Wet movement. Uh, and uh, it used to be just a hashtag, and now it's much more than that. Uh, and we have three simple principles. Um, it's minimize air exposure, eliminate contact with dry surfaces, and reduce handling. And so we work with other partners in the recreational fishing industry, media influencers, uh, all, and it's all science-based. So behind this team, behind the, these simple messages, we have science, we share science with folks, and we have advocates, usually fishing guides, that help to share our messaging. There are codes of practice that exist, but they tend to be dry. No angler is going to slip a code of practice into their tackle box when they go fishing. So we're trying to keep things accessible. The keep fish wet example, we have waterproof stickers and plastic cards that people can bring with them. Last thing I want to hit on is sanctioning. Uh, and this is just sort of that idea that as people are out on the riverbank, they are interacting with other anglers. They're seeing other folks fishing. And some of our work in British Columbia suggests that although people don't engage in a lot of sanctioning right now, and to be clear, I'm not talking about vigilanteism, I'm not talking about violence, I'm not talking about yelling, I'm talking about, hey, I saw you land a really nice rainbow trout. Do you want help getting that off the line? Or, hey, I could show you a way to do that that would be better so that that fish would be more likely to survive. And so whether it's sanctioning or nudges, these are things that are coming out of the behavioral science world. There's a lot of opportunity to embrace those. So as I wrap up here, it's really about the angler. That's really where we focus the fish. And I know this conference is very much centering the fish, but it's also centering the fishers, the industry, and in our case, the, the angler. That's the individual who interacts directly with the fish and the environment. They've got a lot to bring to the table in terms of, of knowledge. We can regulate. But at the end of the day, compliance requires understanding as, as well. Uh, we know that voluntary actions can be enabled, uh, and we're certainly working on, on creative ways to engage anglers and make that happen. We argue that sustainability within the sector uh, and its continued persistence, so that social license to continue to engage in recreational fishing, requires angling, anglers that are willing to engage in responsible behaviors. I've underlined that word responsible, and you have not heard me use the word welfare very much in this presentation. Okay? My last point is, in the recreational fishing space, if I was talking to a room full of recreational anglers, at least in North America, if I said the word welfare, I would, that would immediately be uh, conflated with things like animal rights, animal liberation, and anti-fishing movement, and I would be booed out of the room. So we don't talk about fish welfare. What we talk about is best handling practices. We talk about responsible uh, fishing practices. And it's not just the anglers where that's an issue. It's also with the fisheries managers because they manage populations. And when we start talking about individuals, they tune out. They only care if what we do to individuals scales up and affects population level processes and the things that, that they're responsible they're legally responsible to do. So I just wanted to share, share that. Uh, that's how we engage with the recreational fishing sector. So thank you.